Okay, everybody, um, I have six o'clock now. So with that, um, I'm gonna honor everyone's time tonight and get started. So good evening and thank you so much for joining tonight's Water Wednesday webinar. Um, tonight, we're gonna be talking about Orinda Water Treatment Plant, Power, Performance and Architectural Excellence. Uh, my name is Katherine Horn and I'm a Community Affairs Representative for East Bay Municipal Utility District. We hold these webinars um, on the third Wednesday, approximately the third Wednesday of every month um, to highlight a different topic of interest for East Bay Mud about water and wastewater. This year actually is our 100th year um, anniversary. We're going to be celebrating that in May. So with that, we've been wanting to kind of showcase a lot of our history and what has what it has taken to get us to where we are today. So tonight we'll be discussing one of East Bay Mud's most important and historically significant facilities, the Arinda Water Treatment Plant. Um, as a reminder for those joining, um, we do record these webinars. So by participating tonight, you are agreeing to your questions being recorded. Um, a recording of the presentation will be posted to our website at ebmud.com slash water Wednesday within one week of tonight's event. We will be taking questions throughout the presentation using the question and answer feature. We'll have someone who will be trying to answer them real time, and we'll be flagging some of them to ask at the end um, during our um, question and answer session. If you don't get your question answered tonight, please, um, we'll, we'll be having an email address available at the end for you to be able to send in your any additional questions that come in. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce tonight's speakers. So joining us tonight, we have Jim Smith, who is a former superintendent of water treatment um, at East Bay Mud. Jim began with, at East Bay Mud in 1997 and retired with 20 years of experience in 2017. During his time as superintendent from 2001 to 2017, Jim was responsible for the production of potable water from six water treatment plants, between, ranging between 25 and 190 million gallons a day. Jim also has worked as an adjunct professor at the Solano County Community College, teaching classes with the Bay Area Consortium of Water, where he also served on the board of directors. Jim's experience includes production superintendent for Pennsylvania American Water Company, where he worked his way up from a water treatment operator. And he's also served with the United States Coast Guard. Jim holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Resource Management from Pennsylvania State University and a Master of Science in, from, in Environmental Science from Drexel University. And Jim is also a proud Orinda resident. And then after Jim, we're going to um, be having a presentation from Jeff Bandy, who's going to be discussing um, sort of where we are currently with our water treatment plant. Um, and where we're going into the future. So Jeff is an associate civil engineer with East Bay Mud with 14 years of experience in water and the wastewater industry. He has been with East Bay Mud for almost 10 years and has been the project manager for the Orinda Water Treatment Plant Project since the design started in 2018. Jim is, Jeff, sorry, Jeff, Jeff is now helping to manage the construction phase of the project. Uh, Jeff earned a bachelor's degree in ceramic and materials engineering from Clemson University in 2004, a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering at Duke University in 2007, and a PhD degree in civil and environmental engineering from Duke University in 2009. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim, who is going to kick it off. Thank you, Catherine. The, um, the Grindel Water Treatment Plant is both a beautiful and efficient plant. It was built in 1935 and it's been operating efficiently for 87 years. The designers of the plant did an excellent job of building a plant that could be expanded to meet the needs of a growing metropolitan area. They also built a plant with an architecture that is both taste, tasteful and attractive. But before I talk about the plant, it's important to discuss the water system that brings the untreated or raw water to the plant. The water for the Arinda plant comes from snowmelt in the Sierra Nevada mountains. The district has a watershed, which is mostly undeveloped land that is 575 square miles and provides 90% of the water to our service area and helps us provide superior water quality. Early in 1923, it was apparent that the local water supplies were inadequate to meet the water needs of the East Bay. As a result, a bond was issued to build a dam to meet the growing water demand. 
The party dam, which is 90 miles east of the Arinda plant, was completed in 1927. It impounds water from the Macaulay River, has a capacity of 66 billion gallons, and the size of the reservoir helps improve raw water quality since muddy or turbid water uh, entering the reservoir has a chance to settle due to the long retention time in the reservoir. The first Macaulay aqueduct was completed in 1929. As you can imagine, building a 90-mile pipeline across California with 1920s technology was a difficult task. The project was started in 1926, and the first pipeline was completed in 1929. And here you can see the installation of the first pipeline, um, which is 61 inches in diameter. Not only did they have to lay pipeline across the land, but they also had to run a section across the delta which would have been a challenging task. The second aqueduct was added in 1949 and the third was completed in 1963. These aqueducts are crucial because they provide raw water to the Arinda plant. The aqueducts can also provide water to all six East Bay mud water treatment plants. This map shows the raw water transmission system. In the upper right-hand corner of the map, you can see Party Reservoir, which is near Campo Seco, and the route of the three Macaulay aqueducts to the Arinda plant, which is in the lower left-hand corner of the map. It's a gravity flow system from Part E Reservoir to the plant, so no pumps are required. In addition to the Macaulay aqueduct, a second aqueduct was under construction at the same time. This aqueduct is called the Claremont Tunnel, and it, is, it was also completed in 1929. This tunnel goes from Orinda through the Berkeley Hills and terminates near the western end of the Caldecott Tunnels. The Claremont Tunnel is nine feet in diameter, three miles long, and has a capacity of 175 million gallons. Here's a picture of the west end of the tunnel under construction in 1927. A common question on plant tours is, why was the plant built in Orinda? The answer is because Arinda is the end of the McCallamy Aqueducts and the beginning of the Claremont Tunnel. The water treated at the plant goes directly into Oakland. This map shows the water path from Part E through the McCallamy Aqueducts, treated at the Arinda plant, and then discharged to the Claremont Tunnel and into Oakland, all by gravity. But before the Arinda plant could be designed, a smaller 1 million gallon per day plant was built to treat McCallamy water. It was named the Grant Miller plant. Due to the excellent raw water quality in Party Reservoir, they experimented with only treating the water with chlorine for disinfection and lime for corrosion control. This process is different than the other East Bay mud plants that existed in the 1930s. These plants included additional processes of coagulation, flocculation, and sedimentation to treat their source water from the local reservoirs of San Pablo and Upper San Leandro. Coagulation is the process of adding a positively charged chemical to the water to neutralize the negatively charged particles in the water to improve filtration. The testing was successful, and the Rinda plant was built without flocculation and sedimentation basins. In the 1930s, the Arinda plant initially operated without coagulation. However, to meet today's water quality standard, the plant does coagulate the water. The Arinda plant was built before most of the city of Arinda was developed. The plant was constructed on ranch land, as you can see in this picture, as this grader is preparing the ground for the filter plant. Before East Bay Mud was established in 1923, most of, the water in Costa Costa, most of the water in Contra Costa County came from private water companies. Ranches in Arinda got water from individual wells and springs. The Arinda plant was designed by Mark Daniels and built by East Bay Mud staff. Construction started on July 1st, 1934, and the plant went into service on May 28th, 1935. It cost about $395,000 to construct the plant. Its initial capacity was 42 million gallons per day with eight filters. This is a cost of about $9,400 per million gallons. Today, it would cost about $5 million 
dollars per million gallon to build a similar plant. The designers of the plant were very innovative and forward thinking. The plant originally had eight filters to meet the needs of the 1930s and 40s. The original eight filters can be seen in the red box. The, the designers knew the East Bay was growing, so they needed to provide su sufficient space between the end of the eighth, fil eighth filter and the chemical building to allow for expansion. As you can see this in this picture, the, the, the plant has expanded from eight filters to 20 filters, and their plant capacity has increased by almost 500%. The Arinda plant is the largest of the six East Bay Mud plants and has the capacity to produce 190 million gallons per day. It serves 800,000 of our 1.4 million customers. The filter building was, designed, was designated as a national landmark on November 15, 1998. This is the first building in Arinda to be designated as a national landmark. The Arena plant is a great example of an Art Deco design. The plant has numerous beautiful architectural features. I worked at the Arinda water treatment plant for 20 years. My office was on the top floor of the old chemical, bowl, chemical building, shown on the right. Uh, and I can honestly say that every day I came to work, I would think it's great to have a job that's crucial to public health and be surrounded by interesting architecture too. Consequently, I wanted to compare the building at the Arinda plant to other Art Deco buildings from the 1930s. I went to a website named the 10 Most Impressive Art Deco Buildings in the World. The building that immediately caught my eye was the Griffith, Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, uh, which was also built in 1935, and it's pictured on the left. I noticed numerous similarities between the two buildings. Both buildings have a lot of bas relief designs or carved features protruding from the flat background, which is on the walls and over the windows and over the doors throughout the building. They both use arches and curved lines throughout. I also like the large brass lanterns next to the old chemical building doors. Next, I went to a website, what is the Art Deco color palette? And the predominant color an Art Deco design was warm tans. The buildings that got my attention, the building that got my attention was the Huntington Art Gallery in San Marino, California. Both the gallery and the plant have the classic Art Deco tans. The Art Gallery on the left and the filter building on the right, I found really striking similarities between the two buildings. For example, the railings over the doorways. The one feature I like on the, on the filter building are the two gargoyles shown in the red circles. They are rain spouts for the roof and fun to watch when it rains. Another beautiful feature of the plant is the ceiling in the entryway of the filter building. You can see outstanding woodworking craftsmanship and a beautiful stained glass lantern. It really is a special place in the plant. As I mentioned earlier, the Claremont Tunnel conveys water from Arinda to Oakland. In this picture, the F1 weir, or the entry point to the tunnel, is shown in, by the round um, concrete structure there. The wall behind it um, is, a, is a bas relief that tells the story of building the plant and the tunnel. The Federal Arc Project of the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA, commissioned this bas relief. The WPA was a New Deal program from 1935 to 1943 that funded various projects, including visual artists. The designer of the wall was Elliot Sandow. One part is, uh, of this bas relief that's particularly interesting is this section, which depicts an accident that occurred in the tunnel on November 26, 1926, which was a very bad rainstorm drowned 10 men in the tunnel. And here you can see a man laying on his side with water on top of him. My favorite part of the bar relief is the last scene. It shows a mother holding her child and opening a tap and fresh clean water coming out, which is the number one mission of the district. Thank you for your time and I'll turn it back to you, Catherine.
Thank you so much, Jim. Um, that was fantastic and really interesting. And um, I'm sure it was amazing being able to, to be in those buildings every day for, for a good 20 years. So thank you. And thank you for coming really out was. of retirement for tonight. Great place to work. <laughs> All right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Bandy, who's going to, uh, let me just make sure my, I'm on the right slide. Oh, Jeff, did I go too far? Sorry. Okay, I did. Sorry. Okay, who is going to be presenting on the Arinda Water Treatment Plant Disinfection Improvements Project? So thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Catherine, and good evening, everybody. Um, it's really my pleasure to um, get to tell you guys a little bit about a very exciting project that uh, we just started construction on. I've been living and breathing this project for the past five years, all through design. Um, so this is really uh, a generational leap in how we treat water at um, our most important water treatment plant. So we can go ahead and get started. So you can cycle through a couple arrows here. So what we're looking at here is a, another um, aerial photo of our Rinda water treatment plant. And as Jim explained, um, we have very pristine water. So the treatment process is essentially the same uh, as it was back in 1930, uh, save a, a few uh, small adjustments. So uh, the arrows you see here just trying to get you oriented a little bit on how water flows through the, through the plant. Those uh, two arrows that connect on the um, east side of the filters, that's how the wa raw water enters the plant. Where they touch is where we add that coagulant and flocculant. And then that water gets directly applied to the filter. So no sedimentation basin that a uh, more modern water treatment plant would use to um, let all that sedimentary material uh, collect and be easier to filter out. And then that big line you see in the back, that's where um, actually that bas relief structure is, and then the connection to the Claremont Tunnel, and that's how the distribution works. So uh, this site is actually also the home of one of our critical pumping plants, the Los Altos pumping plant. Um, and on top of that, Arinda uh, filter plant is our only must run plant. It's the only plant of ours that produces water year round. Um, and that's actually going to continue throughout the construction of this major project that I'll be describing tonight, um, except for a couple very short shutdowns. Um, so overall, Arenda Water Treatment Plant is really the heart of the East Beam Mud system and can serve, um, as Jim mentioned, customers uh, throughout our distribution system. Next slide, please. All right, so um, here's a quick diagram of our current, current multi-step treatment process at the Arenda Water Treatment Plant to start talking about how water is treated here. Um, so that raw water or untreated water from the McKinley River, our aqueducts, um, gets dosed with uh, chlorine, and that's our primary disinfectant. Um, then it goes through sand and carbon filtration. That's the filtration step on the right. And uh, then at the tail end of the plant, we add fluoride, uh, some caustic soda for corrosion control and some ammonia for residual disinfectant in our distribution system. And then it goes straight to our, uh, to our Claremont tunnel and then out to distribution. Um, and historically, this relatively simple treatment process has been sufficient for our pristine snow melt. We're lucky to have the best raw water that you can possibly ask for. Um, however, due to climate change, we're experiencing uh, much more variation in our raw water quality. Um, which at times can really challenge um, how much of a buffer, how much of a safety factor we have in our treatment process. We always treat above and beyond, um, but uh, with the recent water quality upsets, uh, we had to kind of look at other options and ways to really modernize um, the most important process that we do with the district, which is disinfection. So the next slide shows um, exactly what this project is all about. So you can see um, we have a new disinfection system that we'll be constructing downstream of filtration. So filtration is gonna get rid of the sediment, um, organic matter, things like that. So we're uh, disinfecting a, a much cleaner um, and easier to treat um, process or uh, raw water quality. So uh, the, this new disinfection process will um, better protect our public health by giving us uh, more tools to treat the water and will uh, let us do so with much lower chemical use uh, than our current methods. Next slide, please. All right, so what you see here is um, uh, some 3D renderings of really the, the flagship part of our, of our project. So um, the system that we're building 
is a combination of a below ground disinfection facility and an above ground um, support building. That's the maintenance and UV electric, electrical building you see on the top right. Um, that's got the facilities for our maintenance staff um, and all the electrical equipment that supports the UV system underground. But when, if you pop that off of the structure, then you see the, the blow up here. Um, so you can see how water from our filters enters in at the bottom of the slide. It gets split between um, those UV systems, the ultraviolet disinfectant systems, and then spills into um, a serpentine chlorine contact basin, uh, at which point it goes, uh, the water's been fully disinfected, it's ready to go, and then it goes into our distribution system back to the bottom of the slide. The overall footprint of the structure is about a football field size. Um, and the next slide will give you a little bit better idea of the scale that we're talking about. So there's a couple animations here if you just want to get all the one more. Perfect. Okay. Oh, so this is the um, cross-sectional view of that structure we were just looking at. And it's a bit of an iceberg, right? So you've got the large building above, gray, above ground, but below ground, that's where the, the action's happening, right? So um, this is also giving you an idea of why this is such a complicated project. So as Jim mentioned, a, a key part of our system, um, and it's kind of an engineering marvel, we can get the water from our um, reservoirs up country all the way to our customers without having to pump. It's all fed by gravity. And we did not want to break that paradigm with our project. Um, but in order to do that, we have to meet the water where it's got pressure, right? So we had to build this whole thing deep underground. Um, and uh, deep underground is, means about 65 feet uh, excavation. Um, so uh, it's a major uh, civil uh, earthwork uh, project as well. Next slide. Um, so our project was designed using state-of-the-art 3D design tools. Um, so the uh, benefit of that is that we have lots of great renderings of our new system. Um, so here's a picture of what our UV disinfection facility will look like when the project's complete. Um, so we're about 30 feet underground right here. Um, and just for scale, each one of those UV systems you see um, has 60 uh, long light bulbs in it, and the diameter of that pipe is about four feet. Um, so this is this is uh, really the the heart of the the new system that's going in. Another major component of this project um, is a complete overhaul of the plant's chemical storage and transfer systems. Um, so this work will improve the safety and reliability of these critical systems at the plant. Um, and again, we did this in 3D, uh, which is great for a lot of reasons. You can resolve conflicts, you can communicate ideas a little bit better. Um, but this also gives you an appreciation of the scale of the project. Uh, the previous slide showed you know, the big stuff. This slide is showing the little stuff. You can see all the tiny details that um, have to be right in order to um, get these systems online. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned this is a must-run facility we're going to be doing this level of detail and this level of effort for both the temporary systems that we're, the plan is going to switch over to and the new systems that will be put into place. Um, so it's a, a major effort, but this is kind of the other, um, the other uh, component of this project. So I did want to um, have a quick slide about um, how the district approaches construction and the kind of things that we prioritize when um, uh, really any project of any size, but especially this project, which, which happens to be the largest single um, contract that the district has ever awarded for, for construction. So these are what we call our pillars of success. So uh, first and foremost, um, safety is number one. So we incorporate safety into the project by design, and we perform construction in a manner that really makes safety the, the number one for priority. And the, our goal every day is for everyone to go home uh, the same way they showed up. Uh, the second one is quality. Um, so we uh, meet or exceed all of the water industry standards so that these major investments uh, are enduring investments for us and our customers. Um, schedule and cost control is important for any construction project. Um, we base our construction on the best information we've got available 
And we develop a lot of contingency plans so that we can mitigate the risk as things come up during construction as they always do. Um, client satisfaction is a very important component. And the client in this case is the Jim Smith, right? The guy who's gonna be running the plant when we turn the keys over, when the big project's done. Um, and we involved uh, you know, the, the operations people every step of the way to make sure that we were giving them something that they um, could champion and, and uh, understood the need for and um, you know, get them excited about it. And um, last but not least, of course, community relations. Um, that's part of why I'm here tonight. Um, we at the district have a mission of providing um, reliable, high quality water um, day in, day out. Um, but these kind of projects, of course, have an unavoidable um, impact on the community. And so um, over the past you know, number of years during design and now that we're in construction, um, we do everything we can to engage uh, our customers, engage the public, um, get them involved in the preparation of environmental documentation, kind of public review periods, um, and even Q&As like, like tonight is a big part of, uh, of how we do business. Okay, um, almost done here. Here's a um, photo of just a portion of our, our project team. Um, it's a very large team. It includes district staff from construction, design, operations, and maintenance. Um, and uh, also, of course, we're working very closely with our general contractor and the many subcontractors who are working on this job. Uh, and we have um, a bunch of extremely uh, talented uh, consultant designers who are supporting us as well. And we're all working very hard, um, especially now that construction started, uh, to deliver this critical project on time and on budget. All right, um, here is a less cartoony version of that uh, mega structure that I showed earlier. Um, and just want to put a plug on um, the uh, project webpage that our um, uh, public relations department has uh, put together for us. There's a tiny URL there. But if you search Google for the Arenda Water Treatment Plant Disinfection Improvements Project, it's the first thing that'll pop up. So with that, um, I think I'll hand it back over to Catherine to um, get some questions uh, from everyone in the audience. Thank you so much. All right, fantastic. Thanks so much, Jeff, and thanks so much, Jim. So um, we have questions coming in, um, and you know we we've. Um, been asked that we save more time for questions um, at the end of the at the end of these programs. So we are going to do that tonight, and um, we're going to do our best. But you know, we we get a lot of questions. So if you're if you are um, did not get your question answered tonight, you can always email waterwednesday at evmed.com um, with any additional questions, and uh, we'll try to get you an answer. So um, with that, um, let's see. There was one that I wanted to flag. So. Um, uh, Jeff, so why did you, why are we choosing to install uh, UV versus ozone at this plant? Yes, that's a very good question. So um, we have ozone at other water treatment plants. Um, that does a few things for us, but primarily ozone is fantastic at taste and odor control, right? So just a little bit of ozone will make water taste very, very fresh. Um, Though the plants that we do have ozone uh, currently running are those, um, uh, the plants that Jim was mentioning before, Upper San Leandro and Sobranti water treatment plants. Those plants are fed by our terminal reservoirs. So those are large open bodies of water like Upper San Leandro Reservoir, San Pablo Reservoir. Um, and because they are essentially surface water, um, they're much more um, prone to having taste and odor issues. So um, ozonation is great. It's a very effective disinfectant. Um, but because mm -hmm. of Orinda, we have the benefit of a very pristine um, raw water that essentially has no taste or odor concerns, um, then ozone is not necessarily the right, um, the right technology. And I think this is a good, um, a good question to kind of tee up the fact that um, there was a very extensive alternatives analysis to select this project. So. Um, Although it looks pretty intense on the face of it, um, we looked at, we looked very closely at about eight or nine alternatives and this penciled out as the least expensive and, and um, least impactful to the public of all the alternatives that we're looking at. Um, so uh, that's a little bit of where ozone fits into our portfolio and why, <clears throat> why we don't see it here, here in this project. 
Okay, fantastic. Um, so this would be a question for Jim. So um, does Arinda use this water? Well, I mean, there is a Los Altos pumping plant. Um, um, so there are sections of Arinda that, that do get the water, but it's only a small amount compared to what um, is produced every day. Um, I'm going to take this one. So um, are we able to visit the treatment plant? So that's a great question. Um, so for about the last 20 years, we've been really been for security reasons restricting access to our water treatment plants. Um, but we have been um, uh, kind of doing away with that and, and really getting the um, customers engaged and offering um, kind of tours on a case by case basis for school groups, high schools, etc. This plant currently is in some pretty extreme construction um, as, uh, right now, so we would not be offering any kind of public tours just for safety reasons. Um, but what I would recommend is going onto our website, and we do offer regular tours at our wastewater treatment plant. Um, that's our that's the treatment plant, sort of um, right underneath the the Bay Bridge, um, and there's regularly scheduled uh, tours there, which are super interesting. So. Okay. Um, maybe Jeff, um, would you want to talk about any steps taken for earthquake mitigation with this project? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I showed that cross section of the system and how deep down it's going. Um, a big part of this project is um, the shoring system that is put being put in place to essentially uh, keep the dirt and water out of the construction zone. Um, and provide a stable working environment for building this, this system from the ground up. So um, that's a, a fully engineered system. It's got big soil nails that anchor everything to the ground. Um, and uh, one of my favorite sort of um, like uh, interesting tidbits about the project, um, the base of that structure that I was talking about is actually six feet of concrete. And that's intended to, um, to overcome the uplift, the hydraulic uplift from the groundwater. So there's a lot of underground forces to consider, um, not only earthquakes and earth movement, um, but also groundwater. So um, yes, the, um, generally the project is um, of course compliant with um, uh, civil structural design standards that take into account the most recent um, codes. Uh, and um, so that the structures are uh, built with a um, kind of a safety factor um, that you would think of for other critical infrastructures, like um, not quite to like hospital level, but still very high um, standards for uh, earthquake safety. Um, so yeah, the, the structural stuff is really fascinating, especially once you get as deep underground as we're getting. All right, thanks. So um, Jim, we're getting a lot of questions about um, uh, the use of chloramine or ammonia in the um, disinfection process. Are you able to speak on that and sort of a little bit more about the chemicals that we use to treat the water? Um, sure, um, as far as chloramines go, um, chloramines um, is when you, um, you, you've, you've filtered the water and you're, you're going into the distribution and you add a little bit of ammonia. And what that does is it um, allows, it changes the, the, the type of chlorine that it is from free ammonia to, to, to total ammonia uh, or combined ammonia. And uh, that's not as reactive with the, the pipe walls and it lasts much longer in the distribution system. And um, it also, um, which is good for disinfection because you wanna make sure you have a chlorine residual throughout the um, 4,200 miles of pipe that we have at the district. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a better way of, of maintaining a disinfectant in the distribution system. It's also better for taste and odor um, because if we tried to run um, free chlorine um, to the very ends of the system, we would have to have a much higher free chlorine residual leaving the plant, which would mean higher disinfection byproducts. Great. Um, so um, there was some questions, Jeff, about um, you had mentioned that the the source water is changing because of climate change. Um, can you yes. talk a little bit about more more about that? Absolutely. Yeah. 
So um, climate change is a kind of multi-factor stressor on our environment, right? So um, there was actually a, a precipitating event that kind of forced us to really think about how to modernize the plant. So um, it's not too far in our rear mirror. Um, the 2012 to 2016 drought that we recently got out of was a historic drought. Um, it was uh, a, really a five alarm fire for the district. And that really, I think that that event kind of shifted people's perception and got think, people thinking about conservation in a different way. Um, so that event uh, kind of ended with a um, unprecedented level of precipitation um, in the winter of 2016, 2017. Um, because of the drought and the huge amount of rainfall that we got in our watershed, um, th that's more of the um, kind of weather weirding that we're talking about, right? Very dry periods followed by very wet periods. All that precipitation washed a lot of you know, dead trees, you know, vegetable matter, uh, and all that organic matter hit our watershed. Um, and because of that, all that organic matter really in interfered with our disinfection process um, and uh, kind of showed us how, um, how we weren't really prepared for the next hundred years of you know, the, the um, kind of climate change oriented stuff that could happen in our watershed, right? So um, that's where we want to move away from something that is um, comparatively fragile and dependent on very consistent good water quality like we've had for the past almost 100 years and move to something that um, is more robust and um, isn't quite as dependent on those big swings between droughts and, and big uh, weather events. Um, so uh, that's that's the type of climate change issue that we are directly addressing with this project. Um, and then how is this project funded and what is the total cost? Yeah, so um, the project is funded uh, like all of our construction projects through bonds. Um, the awarded uh, contract total was um, $267 million. Um, but then when you lump in all of our um, consultant support project uh, contracts, um, some materials that the district has furnished, um, and of course, all of the district time, all the staff time that goes into it, we're up to about $325 million. So um, that 267 is what we signed to the contractor, um, and then all the extra is you know, the, the support that it takes to get a project like this constructed. Thanks. Um, so Jim, um, does San Francisco use the same source water that we do? No, um, San Francisco has a similar system, um, but different reservoir and different aqueducts. So uh, San Francisco's reservoir is Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, um, which is also um, in the Sierra uh, foothills and it's you know very high quality water, um, but it's a different reservoir and it has different aqueducts. So the, the cool thing about the Hetch Hetchy system, um, both our reservoirs and the Hetch Hetchy were identified as um, uh, uh, good places to build dams during the same survey work back in the teens and 20s. Um, we were actually a little ahead of San Francisco, but we basically won. We were in what, what we think is a bad drought pales in comparison to what we were looking at, uh, you know, in the early 30s. We had like weeks of water left. Um, so that that same survey that found these two locations were sort of part of the same uh, same effort where people were going up country. We got to find water. So San Francisco and, and East Bay were um, kind of uh, run, running the same path to find these um, very similar, um, you know, granite lined, pristine mountain sources. Okay, great. So, um, Jeff, you talked a little bit about um, disinfection byproducts um, and this being sort of a response to to treat to dealing with that. Um, what are some of the short term measures that we've been doing? And maybe Jim, too, if you can answer this a little bit of uh, uh, to monitor and to keep those THM levels down. Yeah, so the um, the disinfection byproducts of THM that um, Catherine just mentioned is the total trihalomethanes. It's one class of 
a lot of chlorinated disinfection byproducts. So um, the best way uh, to um, kind of monitor and control it um, is actually uh, a, a system that is it's federally dictated. So we have to do um, regular monitoring of our effluent um, and out in the distribution system as well to um, report up to the state and the federal level how much disinfection byproduct we are sending out to the, to the distribution system. Um, there is a federal limit um, that uh, on a rolling basis, on an average basis, you, you um, cannot exceed. Our internal limit at the district, that's kind of our action level, is actually half that. So once we started exceeding half the federal limit, that was the big red flag to us that we had to do something about it. But all we can really do is be as, um, as uh, careful as possible and controlled as possible with how we perform chlorination um, in the aqueducts um, to have very good monitoring of how we're operating and how that is um, you know, falling out in the disinfection byproducts we're seeing. But um, you know, that, this is essentially why we're doing the project because right now we don't have a lot of tools to um, you know, react to those changing raw water qualities. Um, but uh, getting away from chlorination before filtration um, and putting it downstream filtration and then having that UV disinfection and chlorine that are um, kind of working in tandem and are, um, are designed to hit specific disinfection targets at the lowest dose necessary. Um, that's, uh, I'd, I'd say the, the cop-out answer is we fix it by having a project like this. But <laughs> in the short term, um, it's really just um, having very good eyes on the process and, um, and being very mindful uh, about uh, how these numbers are changing throughout the year. Yeah, I can add one thing to that too, is the uh, Arinda plan has an online THM monitor. So um, we constantly see the THMs coming out of the plant. So if it starts to change, you know, we can, we can say, hey, what's going on? And we can, we can make an immediate change as opposed to um, waiting for a lab to, you know, send a sample to the lab and waiting time for that on, on a quarterly basis. So it's, it's one of those constant um, tools that we have that we can see um, THMs um, all the time. Okay, um, so this might be a Jim question. Jim, how, do you know how long it takes for water to get from Party Reservoir through down the aqueducts and then from there to, to I, that that's variable once it makes this happen, but let's just say from, from Party Reservoir to a Rinda water treatment plant. Do you know how long it takes? Well, it, I mean, it, it, it varies quite a bit because um, there's three aqueducts and there's also three plants on the aqueduct. Um, there's the Walnut Creek plant, there's the Lafayette plant, and um, then there's the Arinda plant. Um, but I would say in a general rule of thumb, it takes, it takes a few days to, to get here. Um, if, there's a, if there's some sort of a, a problem with um, a party upstream, I mean, I would say in general, two or three days later, it comes into Arinda. All right, thank you. I just have to, to make a nod to Gail G, who's giving us a lot of support here in, in her comments and says, honestly, 325 million price tag sounds like a deal. So I, I agree. <laughs> it's a bargain. <laughs> um okay. Let's see. Let me let me just go through. Um oh, okay. Um Oh yeah. So, um, can, uh, Jeff, can you talk a little about about what happens during power outages, and um, particularly, you know, the public safety power shutoffs that PG&E does, and what we yes. do? And maybe Jim can talk about this too about what we do to ensure that you know that the plant keeps running. Yes. So we have a standby generator um, uh, at the plant right now um, that has all sorts of interlocks. So um, if a planned or unplanned power event happens. Um, then we can switch to that. Um, it is something that uh, we try not to use as much as possible um, because you know running a generator versus being on on line power uh, is you know much much cleaner. Um, but this is actually good um, kind of segue to a big part of the project that I didn't get into really any detail about. Um, the project also includes a um, 
2,500 kilowatt um, generator. So this is going to be a new generator that is going to um, not only provide backup power to the plant, but also to Los Altos pumping plant, that critical pumping plant that we're talking about. So, um, and that is exactly because of um, PSPS events, the power safety, uh, 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 the, the shutoff events from uh, PG&E uh, when we're in fire season. Um, so it's really relying on both our existing, but you know, getting pretty long in the tooth um, uh, standby generator, and then this new um, generator and fuel storage tank that's going in um, that's going to provide that critical redundancy um, you know, if and when power events do happen. And I also mentioned that the, that we test the generator every month. Yep. So um, it, it's not like it just sits there and then there's a power failure <laughs> and we hope it works. Um, there's there's a controlled starting and stopping of the emergency generator every month. Okay, so there's a question um, about what, how does the water tank on the other side of San Pablo Dam Road factor into this project? Um, I don't know if that's the wash water tank or one of our, our uh, distribution reservoirs. Jeff, do you know? I, I think the question is probably about our backwash water tank that's in the neighborhood across the street from Camino Pablo, right? So the way that these filters work, um, we load them up. And then after a certain um, volume of water that goes through, uh, you've got to wash the filters, right? So that's called a back a backwash. Um, and we, what we do is we pull off some of that filtered water from below the filters and send it up to that tank. Um, it's actually one of the major bottlenecks of the plant is that that tank is really small, um, and that's another limitation on what how how much different, how many different kind of water qualities we can treat. Because if there's a lot of sediment coming in, then we have to do more backwashes. Um, so that tank gets drained down pretty quick. But that's the function of that tank. It, it gets pumped up and it sits there. And then it's got that hydraulic head available to um, send back down to the plant um, and wash the filters. So we slowly lift the filter media up with water, um, uh, kind of spin it around and, and get all the gunk knocked off of it. And then that uh, wash water goes into our sedimentation bonds, uh, ponds across from Manzanita. So that's our backwash water um, containment tank. Okay, thanks. Um, so we're getting some questions about, um, you know, is, is the water safe to drink from the tap? And then also, how does it compare with bottled water? Um, so Jim, do you want to take a stab at those? Um, Absolutely, it's safe to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I travel quite a bit and I've traveled around the country quite a bit. And um, I, I think East Bay Mud is one of the best tasting tap waters in the country. Um, and um, and that's, I think, a great deal in part of because the raw water source is is so good. Um, I mean, in this re in this recent rain, um, the um, turbidity um, coming into the, or the amount of cloudiness of the water coming into the plant went up to 20 NTU, which is the unit it's measured in. Um, well, I used to work on a river and the, the raw water coming in was 2000 NTU and sometimes higher than that. Um, so, you know, our um, high raw water, uh, a, a situation where the raw water quality is worse than we normally expect, um, was better than the water I ever received when I worked on a river. <laughs> I don't ever remember getting water that had a raw water turbidity of 20 NTU. It was usually like 50 or 60 or 100 or something like that. So yes, yeah, so I think the water's uh, not only safe, but I think it, it, it tastes great and it's it's very, um, you know, I don't think there's any problem with that. I'm sure Jeff would agree. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, it's the, the pat answers that we, you know, follow all state and federal limits for all of the many um, uh, regulations we have to meet. There's disinfection and disinfection byproduct uh, regulations. Uh, there's really a whole slew of stuff that we have to continuously monitor to make sure that the, the water is safe to drink. Um, but I mean, we, we're very lucky that not only is it safe, it's really delicious. Um, and, you know, bottled water is uh, a relatively unregulated kind of environment. Um, you know, there's stories uh, not too long ago 
in the UK, um, some bottled water had to be taken off the shelf because it had high levels of bromate in it. Um, and so it's you're paying a lot and you're kind of rolling the dice <laughs> with bottled water. Um, I, I think I understand when you're living in a place where the tap water is not quite as delicious as ours is, um, but uh, you know, I've definitely drunk the Kool-Aid. Uh, East Bay Mud Water is uh, essentially as good as it gets. Well, I'll mention that the um, bottled water is under the Food and Drug Administration, so it does not have to meet the same regulations that the EPA requires for drinking water plants. Um, and um, the, the the testing for bottled water is is the frequency is I don't know I think it's maybe once a year or something like that um, compared to you know testing water continuously all the time. Fantastic. We're getting a lot of questions about whether there's any plans to install solar panels at the plant. Um, but with that, I would also just like to add, we are actually about to um, start construction on a, a, a solar PV project, five megawatt solar PV project, not too far from the plant on East Bay Mud's um, East Bay Mud owned land off of Bear Creek Road in Orinda. So that's going to be starting construction um, actually in, in, a, in a couple months. Um, but Jeff, any plans to add uh, panels to the plant? Uh, not at this time. Um, I mean, one of the one of the features of the plant is that it's very, very small. It is a postage sized stamp, uh, postage stamp size plant compared to how much capacity it has. So for photovoltaics, this project on Bear Creek Road that Catherine mentioned is um, is more practical and going to get us much more bang for our buck. Um, but not to say that at some point in the future. Um, We'll be putting up, um, you know, roof-mounted solar panels. There's just there's not a lot of roof uh, real estate at Arenda, but um, definitely something that's uh, a big part of our environmental stewardship that we're you know district-wide we're looking at. And the, the Sobrante plant has solar uh, power yep. on the Clearwell, so there are plants that have solar panels. Um, Arenda, because like Jeff was saying, is too small of an area, we can't do it. But there are solar panels on some of the plants. Okay, um, so someone was asking about, you know, we uh, we purchased water um, from the Sacramento River during times of drought, as we did um, this last year. Um, so is that treated differently than party water? Well, the, the Sacramento River water does not go to the Arinda plant. Um, the aqueducts can be configured, so it can go into the San Pablo Reservoir. So that would be treated by the Sobrante or the San Pablo water treatment plant. And there's pumping that can also pump it over to the upper San Leandro plant. So the answer is yes. It, it that would go to a plant that would have um, sedimentation and flocculation basins. Great. Um, and how often are operators required to test the water and at what points during the process? Well, in addition to the online monitors, every four hours they um, take grab samples and they um, analyze them in the laboratory. Um, to ensure that the online monitors are working properly. So uh, er, continuously and every four hours. Yeah, every four hours around the clock. Every time I go to the plant, um, there's an operator with gloves on, working the instrumentation. And, you know, just to Jim's point, um, those online analyzers are only as good as the, the um, checks that you give them. Um, so it's these, you know, uh, EPA verified uh, benchtop um, measurements that are, are um, kind of the gold standard and we're running them all day long every day. Great. And so how does the scale of this project and at this plant compare to other ones nationally? Um, or uh, just the size of the plant in, in general and and because because the water has to come from such a, a distant source and serve such a dense population. Yeah, there's not a ton of other projects in the past uh, number of years here in North America that kind of match the um, the capacity that we're hitting. So ev the th everything we're putting in has a nameplate capacity of 200 million gallons per day. Um, there's not a lot of other um, uh, municipalities that have projects of this scale. Um, there is a uh, recently years, there was a 1 billion gallon a day um, UV disinfection facility um, in uh, New York. 
um, similar, uh, very high water quality, um, so not a lot of pretreatment, uh, kind of a similar approach to, to going with UV disinfection because if the water is very clean, then that light from the UV bulb can propagate through the whole water column and be very efficient. Um, so yeah, there's, there's not a lot to compare to to this scale, um, probably a handful a year. Um, and you know, definitely um, uh, a, a first of this scale in recent years uh, for the district. The most recent large project that we've done is, is this Folsom South Canal, um, the, the Freeport project that was just mentioned, our drought control water. Um, has there been any concern about flooding at the plant during the extreme storms that we've been getting? I, I think I can take that a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah not not um, not anything that we haven't seen before or have ways to control. Um, there have certainly been events in the past 20, 30 years um, where the vulnerability of the plant to large um, uh, precipitation events uh, has been tested, um, but we have a few things that are helping us out. Um, we actually have a new storm drain that's going, that we actually built um, in partnership with the city um, to get water out of the hills uh, above us um, and directed away from the plant. Um, and uh, we also have some kind of permanent uh, sandbag style gates that we can put up um, if we get a lot of water coming down the hill and that's threatening um, the filters. Um, but during design of this project that I was uh, describing earlier, um, we did a lot of um, hydraulic modeling, 100-year um, flood, 500-year floods, to see how the water would propagate over the site and um, kind of set our elevations to make sure the site drainage was effective. Um, so we're always thinking about where water is going, uh, what we can do to control it, and um, you know, precipitation is a, a major thing that gets considered when a design project like this gets pulled together. Okay, and Jim, are there other water systems that use a similar gravity flow um, process? Um, yes, um, a lot of uh, New York is is one, um, San Francisco, um, uh, Portland. Um, Seattle, I believe, too, also. Um, so yeah, there, there are other large cities that um, gravity flow from their, their source water to um, the city. OK. Um, great. So with that, um, we are just right about at time. Um, so I want to thank our presenters tonight. So thank you so much, Jim, for coming out of retirement to uh, to join us this evening. It's great to see your face again. And it's Jeff, good. of course, thank you so much for um, being able to be here to be the subject matter expert on this really incredible project. It is um, something truly amazing. So thank you guys. Um, as a reminder to all of our participants tonight, um, this is a recorded and will be posted to our um, web page um, at ebmud.com slash water Wednesday. Um, within a week of the recording so you can share it or rewatch it um and it, we had a lot of questions come in tonight um and and glad we could get to so many of them there are still some that that did not get answered if if you guys really have pressing questions please do feel free to email us and i can try to forward your questions on some of them were um you know areas that are not really um jim and, and jeff's wheelhouse although they really know everything about water it seems but um there are some that are that, that would be better um suited for for another subject matter expert. So um, again, please feel free to email us at waterwednesday at ebmud.com. Um, and with that, I'm going to thank everybody uh, for joining us tonight, and we will see you again um, next month um, for, for our next Water Wednesday. Okay. Have a good thank night. You. Bye. Thank, thank you. Catherine.